Good afternoon. I'm Victor Zhao, the president of National Academy of Medicine. I have to tell you, I invited myself to open this meeting. When I found out about this webinar, I said, wow, what an important topic. It's an area that we care so much about at the National Academy of Medicine. So I just simply say, I would love to open this meeting for you. So mm -hmm. thank you, Sue Hesmiller and others for allowing me to do so. First, I want to thank you for joining today's webinar on nursing's role in health equity, public health emergency, and COVID-19. These are critical issues, and they're also critical issues for nursing uh, going forward in 2020 to 2030. So I just want to simply begin by saying that it's been 10 years since the release of the consensus report, The Future of Nursing, Leading Change, Advancing Health. I would tell you that that report is one of the Academy's most successful reports. It's downloaded more than any other reports in the history of the National Academies. And the report made a few important recommendations. It's an action-oriented blueprint for the future of nursing, because this was then 2010. After release of the report, ARP and Robert Wood Johnson Foundation launched a campaign for action that implemented the recommendation report. I think we're all very pleased to say that much progress we made. Many states have removed major barriers to practice for advanced practice nurses, and many give full practice authority to nurse practitioners. Furthermore, we're seeing an expansion and a great increase in enrollment in baccalaureate, PhD, and DNP. And so, and I was at Duke when I witnessed this happen. It was very exciting. We're also seeing an expansion in the leadership role of nurses in healthcare as CEOs, presidents, and vice presidents. And that's also exciting. We all recognize there's a long way to go. We're not there yet. And particularly in the context of the last 10 years or so, a lot has changed in healthcare. And of course, it only emphasizes that nurses are even more important. A variety of current emerging issues that influence the field of nursing range from the passage of the Affordable Care Act and the ongoing healthcare reform to emphasis on patient-centered care, community and population health, social determinants of health, and the emergence of technology information, electronic health record, and other technology to name few. These are all relevant to the practice of nursing. And more recently, the public health emergencies such as COVID-19 have highlighted a critical important role of nurses uh, in this particular crisis. So as been written, nurses are on the front line of public health crisis. They are leading the way in terms of looking at what to do in a crisis. You know, that's what they do anyway in most of the time of their usual work, but during crisis, visibility and awareness that working together is important. And the pandemic is highlighting the need for team-based care, infection control, person-centered care, and other skills that really speak the strength of the nurses. But we also recognize that nurses are shouldering the heavy burdens and are deserving of our strongest support. They're putting lives on the line to care for patients and they're certainly experiencing significant moral injury. So while we already know that nurses experience high rates of burnout, COVID-19 has even unmasked and aggravated this issue. Nurses are experiencing even more pressure exhaustion, isolation, and ongoing emotional trauma. It's also important to understand, of course, that nurses serve in so many community settings. And for more than a century, they fought for health and fought against health inequity, social injustice, and racism. And I think the recent events in our country highlight again the important work of nurses. They have worked to build a culture of health where people live, learn, 
work, play, and have equal access to care. Nurses lead the practice of working with patients in their home and community settings. And therefore, nurses are well positioned to advance health equity and help us combat structural racism. So I think that great changes, opportunities in health and healthcare lie ahead next 10 years. I know nurses will lead the way. And therefore, it's really fitting that an occasion on the 10th anniversary of the IOM report on future of nursing that LWJ once again ask us, now the National Academy of Medicine to perform this consensus study on future of nursing in the next decade. It's really important for us in today's seminar, webinar to think through all those issues. And we do have a panel of experts to discuss how nursing can advance health equity, the role of nursing in public health emergency, the experience on frontline COVID-19, and of course, looking down the road for the next 10 years. I'm really excited about this webinar, which is why I introduced myself or in invited myself to your meeting. But thank you all for coming and thank for allowing me to say a few words. And I'd like to turn over to Susan Heismiller, who will be moderating this webinar. Susan Hasmiller is a senior scholar in residence and senior advisor to me on nursing at National Academy of Medicine. She's also senior advisor for nursing at Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. In this role, she shapes and leads the foundation's nursing strategy in an effort to create a high quality of care in the United States for people, family, and communities. Drawn to the foundation's organization efficacy for marginalized and under-resourced population, Susan's helping assure that LWJ's commitments in nursing have a broad and lasting national impact. So please help me welcome Susan Hesmiller. Susan, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Zhao, and thank you so much for joining us. Really important that you did. And good afternoon, everyone. And we realize that we have a very global audience. So I will say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, I would like to begin by providing an update on the Future of Nursing 2020-2030 study. The release of the report has been delayed so that the committee can consider newly emerging evidence relating to the COVID-19 global pandemic and include recommendations regarding the role of nurses in responding to this crisis. As of this morning, the World Health Organization has reported more than 700,000 deaths and over 22 million confirmed cases globally of COVID. In the United States, more than 170,000 deaths and over 5 million confirmed cases have been reported. This global pandemic has created unprecedented demands on the healthcare workforce, especially nurses. In this regard, the committee will take into account the dramatically changed context and rapidly deploy changes in clinical care, nurse education, nursing leadership, and nursing community partnerships as a result of this pandemic. Therefore, the report is now expected to be released in the spring of 2021. Now, on to today's webinar, and everyone is in for a big treat, if I might say so myself. Today's outreach event is an opportunity to learn from experts on the new themes in the updated statement of tasks. It is also an opportunity for the public to provide input on the nurse's role in responding to COVID. And you can find that new statement of tasks on our website. Following the expert panel, the public will be invited to ask the panelists questions. Please send your questions through the Zoom chat. At this time, it is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce to you the panel of experts. I'm so excited that we uh, have every one of them. First, we will hear from Dr. Lisa Cooper, James F. Fry's Professor of Medicine and Bloomberg Distinguished Professor and Director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Equity. She is an international thought leader on addressing health disparities through her research on the ways race and socioeconomic factors shape patient care and on developing effective and sustainable interventions 
for at-risk populations in partnerships with communities. Dr. Cooper will discuss how COVID-19 has impacted social determinants of health and health inequities. Next on the panel, we will have Dr. Christine Kreshi. She's a professor and associate dean for research in global health nursing at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and her efforts in education, research, and service center on the healthcare workforce development for community-based disaster preparedness and response during bio events. Dr. Qureshi will share information on the role of nurses in public health emergencies and the competencies needed to respond effectively. Last, Mr. Frank Baez, a cardiovascular intensive care unit staff nurse at NYU Langone Health will speak. And I might say he's, he is one of the real heroes. I know nurses have trouble sometimes being called heroes, but he has been there. After immigrating from the Dominican Republic, Mr. Baez started his journey as he started his journey as a janitor. With the inspiration and support of his colleagues, he quickly advanced through multiple healthcare roles before starting his career as a nurse. Today, Mr. Baez will describe the challenges associated with working on the front lines during this pandemic. Dr. Cooper, I'd now like to turn it over to you. Pleasure to be here with you all today um, to talk about a topic that's close to my heart, health equity, and how we get there, um, and what nurses might, what role nurses might play in helping us reach that goal. Next slide. So we have heard a lot about health disparities recently, although this is a problem that has been going on for um, over 100 years in our country. And it's been defined a number of different ways, but, but basically one definition of it is that they are preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optimal health that are experienced by socially disadvantaged populations. That's where we find ourselves now, but our goal and our North Star is actually health equity. And the World Health Organization has defined health equity as when every person has the opportunity to attain his or her full health potential, and no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of social position or other socially determined circumstances. Now to get from health disparities to health equity, we have to understand what contributes to health disparities. And um, we're gonna be talking about some of these things, but basically they are the social determinants of health. And the social determinants of health fall into multiple categories. They range all the way from economic instability uh, related to educational or, or, or employment opportunities, uh, social and community context. We know about things like stress, discrimination, uh, civic participation, access to healthcare, as well as the neighborhood and built environment. So we've heard a lot about things like uh, access to food or housing um, or the safety of the physical environment in terms of exposure to toxins. So we have to address social determinants of health if we wanna to get to health equity. And we've heard a lot of talk recently in the media about structural racism and how that has actually shaped the distribution of social determinants across different groups in our country. So next, um, we're gonna talk about what some of these health disparities are. And admittedly, this is one of the most, uh, actually this definitely sort of underplays the scope of the problem because health disparities in this country occur across multiple conditions, populations, settings and levels of care. And, and so this is just one example which used survey data uh, from people of different racial and ethnic groups and just asking them um, to what extent they had been told that they had asthma or diabetes or heart disease. And you can see that across each of these conditions, there are higher rates of reporting of chronic conditions by people of color, African Americans, Hispanics, and, Asia, and sorry, American Indians, Alaskan Natives for the most part. What this doesn't actually show you is that, in fact, there are death rates that are much higher uh, across many of these groups, particularly African Americans have the highest death rates from cardiovascular disease in our country. 
uh, American Indians uh, from diabetes. Uh, we have higher death rates from uh, numerous cancers uh, across ethnic minority groups and much higher rates of obesity and all sorts of uh, conditions that are actually shaped by those social, negative social determinants of health that we just discussed. So we have this problem that was going on before the pandemic even hit. So who are these vulnerable groups other than the ethnic minorities that I just mentioned to you? Next slide will show that. We have several vulnerable populations and groups in our country that experience health disparities. We just talked about people of color, but we know people with low income, immigrants. We know women are more likely to experience health disparities, children, older adults. And then you can see, as you can see in these other populations, uh, many of these are people that, are, uh, ex that experience negative social determinants of health. So we have rural residents, for example as well as residents within um, the inner city. So when we have people within correctional institutions that experience health disparities. So these are all vulnerable populations in our community. And we've heard more and more about them since the pandemic hit us. Next slide. Now, why is it that we've heard more about them? Well, it's because the challenges that these groups experience on a daily basis are magnified during this time. So many of these groups have lack of access to basic resources. We talked about food, uh, people not being able to get access to healthy food during regular times. And then you have a pandemic where many stores have been closed and people don't have the transportation to get to where they need to go. Water even. People in many communities, many, everybody has heard about Flint, Michigan and the fact that there was lead in the, in the, food, in the water supply there. On the Indian reservations, many people don't even have water to wash their hands, to practice uh, these safe behaviors to keep them safe. Shelter and housing is a problem. We know many of the communities of color include housing that is crowded, that multiple families must live in, multi-generational families, with that increase the likelihood that they will actually spread uh, COVID-19 to one another. A whole lot of media has focused on the fact that people of color tend to be overrepresented in essential jobs. Also people with low income are working these essential jobs that have to be out there during this time and are unable to protect themselves, either because their employers didn't provide enough PPE or um, hand sanitizer, or because they aren't able to spread enough apart from one another to sa safely engage in social distancing and they have to be in and out on using public transportation during this time as opposed to staying uh, away. Many of these groups lack access to basic healthcare services. And, you know, and it's clear that for very good reasons, many of these populations have a mistrust of institutions because there have been centuries of discriminatory experiences that they've had in healthcare, in research, um, and in, in many aspects of society. So you have all of these challenges going on. Now, what are we seeing? We've seen, you know, we heard that we've got the highest in, uh, infection in rates in the world um, right now in this country. What we, what we really talk about much more now that I think a lot of people didn't realize at the beginning of the pandemic is that everyone's not being affected equally. So you can see here that the case rates or the infection rates are two to three times higher among American Indians, Blacks, and Hispanics than they are among whites and Asian Americans. The hospitalization rates are similarly much higher in those groups. And the death rates here uh, show that they're like one and a half times to two times higher in these ethnic groups. But if you see the next slide, you'll see that actually those death rates are underestimated because when you adjust for age, the, the death rates among African Americans, indigenous populations, Pacific Islanders, as well as Latinos and even Asian Americans are much higher than those of whites across this country. So we've got a, a huge problem that is being magnified by this COVID pandemic. How do we address this problem? Um, um, we need to address it on multiple levels. So next slide, please. Um, my colleague, Dr. Josh Sharfstein and I uh, basically prescribed five steps in the beginning of the pandemic to focus on most vulnerable populations. 
We talked about the importance of tracking the data on cases, hospitalizations, and deaths by race, ethnicity, and geography. We can't intervene and we can't solve a problem if we don't know where it is or who's, who has it. We talked about the importance of communicating and building trust with these communities of color that have experienced discrimination over so many years and to get the message out and to understand what more of the concerns are, we really need to, to work with stakeholders who are from those communities. We talked about the importance of enhancing access to testing and healthcare. You can't set up testing that's a drive up location when people don't have cars. You know, you can't require people to sign up for testing online when they don't have computers. You can't re require them to have a referral from a primary care provider when they don't have one. We talked about the importance of protecting essential and low-wage workers. It's imperative that these people have masks and gloves that they can wear when they're at work, that the policies there will protect them from spreading infection to one another, that they get paid sick leave so that they don't feel, they're not afraid to stay at home if they're feeling sick, because if they do come to work while sick, they will spread it to others. It's important to provide essential social services at this time. Make sure there's adequate food delivery to people. Make sure people have places to live. If, if they need to safely quarantine they, and they live in a multi-generational home, they, they could possibly be put up in a dormitory or in a hotel room. So policymakers really need to focus on these five key steps at this time. Now, but on the long term, we're going to really need to tackle this problem on multiple levels. Um, the levels may come from indiv at individual patient, at the level of family, friends, and neighborhood, at the level of the organization, or at the levels of policy and community. There are several different intervention targets that need to be um, uh, employed. This is not going to be a one, you know, one size fits all approach. It's not going to be fix one thing and then we'll get through it. So it's complex and that's why we haven't solved it so far, but that doesn't mean that we can't solve it. It just means that we need lots of collaboration and lots of stakeholders and nurses play an important role in here. This is a particular piece where if we look at all the interactions within a, the healthcare setting for in particular, you can see where nurses play a critical role in interacting with patients and their family members and in making sure that patients have uh, referrals to appropriate community resources. And all of these factors are important for enhancing clinical outcomes as well as equity of services and costs. Next slide. So my colleague, Dr. David Williams and I recently wrote a commentary in JAMA where we talked about the fact that health inequities are a pandemic that has been in existence for a very long time. And in many ways, if we think about how we want to flatten the curve on COVID, we can apply some of those same lessons to health equity. We know that healthcare quality and access matter, but adverse living and working conditions matter just as much, those social determinants of health. And so we really need a systematic, long-term, comprehensive and coordinated set of investments to address the social determinants of health. We're seeing now more than ever that failure to protect the most vulnerable groups in our society not only harms them, but it harms the rest of our society. We've had the spread of this pandemic, it's affected our economy, um, and we are now like all sort of immobilized by this. And so the, the resistance of the spread of poor health will only occur when we have a sufficient proportion of our population that's protected and immune from the negative social determinants of health. So this is a new kind of herd immunity that we call for. Next slide. So again, along these same lines, we thought that the steps towards uh, addressing health disparities fall into these three broad categories. First, creating communities of opportunity, and that's where you really address those, those social determinants of health through things like early childhood education, through things like uh, elevating the minimum wage, um, through things like uh, providing uh, early uh, childhood uh, child care protection so people can go to work building more health into the, the, the delivery of health care, the importance of actually focusing on preventive and primary care, on addressing patients' social needs as part of the delivery of health care, ensuring access to care. And part of that is actually diversifying the workforce, making sure that there are people from underrepresented communities among health professionals who are willing to go and work in those areas, making sure that they are aware of what those social conditions and cultural conditions are and can de deliver patient-centered culturally sensitive care. And then finally, 
raising awareness of inequities broadly to build political will to address them. Next slide. So what, how are we gonna do this? We know that among nurses, we have uh, that they're not representative of the US population. We have the US population is approximately 60% white, but 80% of nurses are white. Uh, you can see that uh, there's underrepresentation of Blacks, Hispanics, and American Indians among nurses, among registered nurses, among nurse practitioners and midwives. And it's sort of comparable to primary care physicians, but actually even worse. So we need to really work to diversify the nursing workforce so that it actually more, more closely mirrors the US population. Next slide. One of the other things we can do is make sure that nurses are involved in all of these activities that facilitate the integration of social needs into the delivery of healthcare. We talked about in this recent report from the National Academies, these five key areas that need to be integrated into healthcare delivery in order to better address patient social needs. There needs to be more of an awareness of what those social needs are. We can either adjust the way we deliver care or we could align our care uh, more appropriately by working with people in uh, community-based organizations. We could offer assistance, for example, by uh, giving you know, travel vouchers or things like that to help people get into healthcare. And we can also advocate, right? Work for changes in policies. Okay, next slide. So the other thing we talked about is the importance of building trust with these communities that have been underserved for so, so long. We talked about the importance of nurturing trust-based relationships with, with leaders, with organizations within our communities, making sure that we have an institutional commitment to health disparities. It's, there's this tension between communities experiencing health disparities and the health systems they, that serve them because it doesn't appear to communities that, that healthcare systems actually care about health. It seems like they only care about delivering health care but not actually about improving health in the community. So we really have to address that tension, uh, what it is about um, our agenda and the community's agenda so that they can see what some of our constraints are and then how we may work with them to address their needs. We need to figure out how we can work together, co-production models. How can we have some organizations working to deliver some of the services that healthcare is not equipped to deliver? We need to measure progress towards any agreed upon areas of focus and, and be accountable to, um, to these communities for improving different metrics, whether it be improvements in blood pressure control, improvements in obesity levels, uh, reductions in uh, substance abuse, uh, whatever those important metrics are to our communities. So we finally most recently proposed two broad strategies for enhancing trustworthiness as a way of enhancing trust with our uh, communities experiencing health disparities. They fall into two big categories, relationship-centered care and structural competency. And relationship-centered care is all about health professionals and uh, the, everyone in the healthcare environment becoming more aware of themselves, their own attitudes and behaviors and how they contribute to health disparities. Understanding their patient populations, participating in making sure that these patients can participate more, communicate and participate more in decision-making about their care, showing respect for individuals, having some shared values and identities, making sure we have diversity among our, our uh, participants. Structurally, more awareness of health inequities and societal injustices, more authentic partnerships, more transparency organizationally, better funding for health equity work, and diverse participation in leadership. Next slide. So this is just a sort of summary overall about the different ways in which nursing could become involved. One, through clinical practice, through better assessing uh, social determinants in the clinical context. We know nurses are particularly well equipped to do that and advocating for community-based resources for their vulnerable populations. In research, nurses are well equipped to design and implement community-engaged studies as well as community improvement projects. In terms of workforce, the curriculum needs to actually incorporate health equity throughout the entire curriculum from pre-licensure to advanced practice and doctoral education. And as I mentioned before, enhancing ethnic diversity. And then finally, leadership. Nurses represent the largest se segment of the healthcare workforce and they could be used so socially and politically to
to advance advocacy efforts. And as the most trusted among health professionals, I can think of no one better equipped, no group better equipped to help advance health equity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. That was excellent. Now I'll turn the podium over to Dr. Qureshi. Aloha, everybody. What I'm going to do is review with you the role of nursing during public health emergencies and discuss some opportunities for the future for actually expanding and strengthening that role. Next slide, please. So as a profession, nursing is um, perfect for disaster preparedness and response, disaster preparedness response and recovery. They are, as a group, ideal to serve in a wide variety of roles across the disaster cycle. As mentioned earlier, nursing represents the largest segment of the healthcare workforce in the United States and actually in most countries across the world. It has been consistently noted to be the most trusted profession. Nurses basically come with a skill set that supports rapid engagement in emergency response as well as emergency response functional roles as needed. By and large, nurses are strongly connected to their communities. In fact, um, only a little bit more than half work in hospitals and the rest actually work in the community-based setting. As time goes on, the nursing profession is moving more and more out of the acute care setting and into the community setting. Next slide, please. So we use these terms, emergencies versus disasters. And COVID-19 is a public health disaster. Emergencies are lower magnitude. There's a disruption that requires immediate response, but there are resources available. Disasters, on the other hand, are very large in magnitude and disruption requires response. And the resources that are available do not match what is required to respond. So clearly one can see that COVID-19 is a public health disaster that has spanned almost every segment of the globe, including the United States. Next slide, please. The National Disaster Management System does note that public health emergencies include outbreaks of infectious diseases, as well as bioterrorist attacks. COVID-19 has not only resulted in widespread illness and death, but also a marked disruption in the social and economic structures of the United States and other countries across the world. Historically, disadvantaged communities are at greater risk during times of pandemic. This was noted from the 1918 pandemic, other pandemics in between, and it certainly has been noted with COVID-19 today. Next slide, please. So let's talk about some specific roles for nurses during pandemics, um, both prevention, response, as well as community recovery. Now, you can see that there are many roles on this slide, and we're, we don't have time today to go over each of them, but it, this slide illustrates how versatile nurses are because they come with a skill set that is readily adaptable. During COVID-19, nurses have been very successful with contact tracing and case investigation. They have been serving in, uh, on telephone hotlines, have switched their practice to telehealth, provided care in mass care centers, um, worked in mass testing endeavors, et cetera and have really advocated for community-based infection control. In the acute care setting, the um, nurses who have provided direct care to those afflicted with COVID-19 or others who have stayed on the scene to provide care to the usual people who come in um, for hospital care. They um, have also, nurses have served as um, educators for families who were concerned about their loved ones and actually served as surrogate family members in some instances when visitation is not allowed. APRNs have risen to the challenge. They have many have switched their practices to telehealth and very rapidly learned how to deliver such services via this medium. Um, they've been engaged in surveillance and case reporting. Nurses are, have been integral for COVID-19 
in key volunteer organizations across the United States. This includes the American Red Cross, the Medical Reserve Corps, they've served on DMAT teams. And at the policy table, nurses um, have sat at the policy table and provided advising, although we hope that that role expands in the future. They have been engaged in strategic planning and they have served in all sorts of roles across the emergency management spectrum, serving as unit leaders, incident commanders, um, et cetera. Next slide, please. So there have been many lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic with respect to the profession of nursing. So overall, it's well recognized that as a professional group, nurses come to the table with a basic skill set that supports rapid adaptation to a wide variety of emergency response functional roles. But some gaps have been noted. Health system planners, in some cases, actually failed to plan for the surge capacity staffing needs that would be required in terms of the types and numbers of nurses that would be needed in both the acute care setting and the community settings. Remember, most people with COVID-19 are not treated in a hospital, they're treated in the community setting, and nursing has adapted to that setting as well. But in the acute care, the lack of um, nurses with critical care skills who can provide intensive cardiac and respiratory care to COVID-19 patients has become apparent. Many of the, we have found that many of the required skills and capabilities for nurses' response during COVID-19 can be traced back to basic fundamentals of nursing. This is what nurses learn in the first course in nursing school. Basic principles of infection control, the correct use of PPE, putting it on and taking it off. For today, most nursing education focuses on the use of such skills in the acute care setting. And what needs to be recognized is that these skills are also required in the community setting as well. So we need to better prepare nurses to work in austere conditions with an acute lack of um, required resources using crisis standards of care. In the United States, um, American nurses are used to having everything they need whenever they need it. And that's not has been the case um, with COVID-19. Next slide, please. gap in the basic epidemiology among some um, nurses in, in practice as well as in the nursing schools. Basic principles of epidemiology, uh, basic knowledge of um, epidemiology is absolutely required for really understanding pandemic prevention, detention, and response, and being actively engaged at the strategic planning as well as the policy table. Nursing education contains little critical and emergency care content today. This actually hinders rapid cross assignments within organizations and rapid upskilling during surge needs. Healthcare responder safety is paramount. We have no, noted that appropriate protocols, adequate types and quantities of supplies and equipment, and appropriate training are essential. We have also learned that leadership and communication is essential, especially during times of uncertainty and lack of resources. There needs to be a system put in place to assure that we provide care for our caretakers. Next slide, please. So now let's talk about some opportunities for moving forward to continue to improve and to expand the capacity as well as the role of nursing for um, positive engagement in pandemic prevention and response. Now, first of all, we need to recognize that we need to prepare across the world for an increase in the numbers and types of pandemics. Urbanization, uh, large social gatherings, mass transit and tra trend Tra transit and travel across the globe, and general increase in the global population density will surely fuel such increases. So 
We need to expand undergraduate nursing education to include, look at the content and clinical rotations and assure that there are experiences in emergency critical care and public health nursing. Focus on all hazards disaster preparedness content and insert basic principles of epidemiology within a nursing curricula. There's another opportunity by reviewing nursing program curricula in the context of the recent International Council of Nurses Core Disaster Nursing Competencies, where there are gaps, work to enhance the curriculum. Next slide, please. There are also opportunities to work with the existing nursing workforce, and that includes practitioners as well as faculty. Continuing education should be provided in areas of disaster, ma disaster management, epidemiology, community-based infection control. There's an opportunity to develop national level continuing education programs that are open access, free of charge, and perhaps completion of the series could earn a certificate. Convene a national task force to address development of a model for surge capacity for disaster nursing workforce for all disasters. Such a model would be useful to guide individual states so that they could adapt for their local context. Advocate for federal funding to support a disaster nursing network across the United States and its affiliated territories to seed and develop the field and implement a plan to assure that responders are available when needed. Using the lessons learned from COVID-19 about disaster preparedness to galvanize um, action at the national level would, be, um, would move nursing a long way in this area. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, the World Health Organization has declared 2020 to be the year of nursing and midwifery. Actually, the roots of modern day nursing come from disaster nursing and community health for the underserved. Florence Nightingale was a disaster nurse with multi and she performed multiple emergency response functional roles. She was a care provider, a trainer, a manager, a statistician, and a consultant to heads of countries. Lillian Wald founded the Henry Street Settlement and was a pioneer in community health nursing and today what we're calling population health. But it, it, this all stems back to Lillian Wald. Across the globe, nurses have been an essential component of COVID-19 pandemic response. It's time to remember our roots and continue to cultivate nursing capacity for pandemic prevention, preparedness, response and recovery. Next slide. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Qureshi, that was very informative. Uh, now I'd like to turn the podium over to Mr. Baez. Hi, today I'm gonna to be speaking about fighting COVID-19 on the front line. These are my experiences, the experience of my colleagues and the experience of many nurses who work in the front line in different hospitals throughout the United States. Uh, next slide. Um, challenges uh, for nurses on the front line. One of the main challenges we faced was uncertainty. We were very uncertain on how to care for COVID-19 patients. The, uh, the lack of available evidence-based treatment created a lot of uncertainty when treating these patients. Also provider safety. Um, for us nurses, we always think about patients first. We always put our patients first and foremost. But during this pandemic, we had to uh, think about ourselves. Whenever a patient was decompensating or we, we had to start CPR, we, before running into the room, we had to first um, protect ourselves by, you know, putting our PPE down and up, and then we can go into the room and uh, do the interventions that we, needed, that we need to do. And this was very challenging for us. Also, end-of-life care to those with no family present at the bedside was very challenging especially because we nurses became the surrogate families of these patients who were there with them when no one else was able to be. Um, a lot of nurses also felt um, social stigma of COVID-19 um, for working on the front line. Um, there, were, uh, there was a public perception of them uh, 
as being contaminated because they simply worked on the front line and we're working with COVID-19 patients, people will think that they probably also had the virus themselves. Um, another challenge was working with limited resources, uh, which is the crisis standard of care. And by far, the biggest challenge was how to provide efficient critical care while at the same time protecting yourself with the available PPE. Next slide. And the impact on well-being of frontline nurses. It was physically, mentally, and spiritually exhausting for a lot of us. There was unrelenting stress brought by the pandemic resulting in nervous exhaustion for all frontline workers. We were very anxious about um, this pandemic. And an example of that is I was taking care of a patient once who had a trach. And then I was going to suction this patient. And when I was getting ready to suction him, the patient coughed really hard. And the band, the ventilator disconnected from from the trach and the secretions came out flying out of the trach into my face shield, my neck and my gown. And at that moment in time, I had a panic attack because I, I felt that I was compromised and contaminated. So I went to the employee health service and got the prophylactic treatment that was available at the time. And, uh, and then I was, I was afraid and I was afraid for my family because I had to go home and I had a lot of anxiety because then at that time I thought, well, I've been compromised and now I have to go home and my family will likely be also compromised as well from this event. Um, and the most significant impact on us nurses was mental health. We were very anxious of caring for very critically ill patients, multiple patients at the same time that were requiring pressors and and a, a lot of different interventions to be able to keep them alive. Uh, next slide. Uh, nurse preparation for pandemic response. Are nurses prepared? The generalist nursing program is comprehensive and allows students to apply critical thinking skills in normal scenarios, but the lack of exposure to a pandemic to implementing crisis standard of care in nursing school made patient care during the peak of the pandemic very challenging for us. Also, we have no experience uh, working in crisis standard of care. We are always used to have all the supplies we needed and more. For us nurses, it's a very hard pill to swallow when we have to provide a limited amount of care to our patients because we want to always do the best we can. And during uh, this pandemic, we have to closer our care. We have to closer our intervention. We have to closer uh, everything that we do for our patients and minimize the amount of time we spend in each patient's room so that we can reduce the risk of cross-contamination and also become an infected because we have to protect ourselves while at the same time protecting the patient and protect our family. Also, a lot of us don't have or didn't have any experience with rapid adaptation. A lot of nurses were reassigned from the original unit into the COVID ICU or the COVID regular floor and uh, that was challenging for a lot of us because uh, nurses who work in patio or in cath lab will have to go up to the COVID ICU to take care of this new patient population, which they have no experience of, and they have to rapidly adapt to the need of this population. Next slide. Key lessons learned to better prepare nurses for the pandemic. It's very important for uh, nurses to stay up to date with evidence-based uh, practice, especially during an unfolding event um, such as this. Also, many nurses do not have a strong foundation and uh, pandemic response. And for a lot of us, this is the first pandemic we're, go we're going through. And for some of us, this is the second, but it certainly it won't be the last. Also, uh, providing crisis standard of care is stressful for all healthcare workers. And um, culture does influence the why, how, and what of care for a specific group. Especially, pandemic response includes attention to the body, mind, and the spirit. And this is the whole where holistic nurses come into play. It's very important that we nurses understand our patient's cultural background so that we can be able to provide the best care we can give them at the time. 
cross assignments to other specialties which support rapid and cross training work. When I was reassigned to the COVID ICU from my original unit, um, the cardiovascular ICU, I had to quickly learn to care for patients on ECMO, which is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, and CRT, which is continuous renal replacement therapy for patients who had kidney failure. And um, I had to get certified on those devices because that, that was what the population needed at the time and a lot of patients were getting cannulated on ECMO and started on CRT. And it worked. A lot of those patients are now nowadays back home with their families and thankfully they recuperated, but I was able to rapidly adapt and evolve to being able to care for those patients in the ICU. Uh, next slide. Advice for healthcare system to prepare all healthcare workers. We need to plan to care for the caretakers. Nurses need to pour at all levels. Assure mental health support for nurses and the rest of the healthcare team. This high level of stress that we've been through in this pandemic will leave long-term impacts on us, especially mental health. We should enhance the training and education of all healthcare workers for crisis standards. We should plan for the search needs of nurses who can provide culturally appropriate care. Since a lot of these patients that we are affected by COVID, they come from vulnerable populations, minorities, and underserved uh, uh, backgrounds. We should acknowledge the enduring work of nurses in a pandemic response. We nurses always um, work together and we always answer the call whenever there is a public um, crisis and it should be acknowledged. We should also support administrative frontline communication with staff, including active listening, especially during pandemic uncertainty. For instance, at NYU Langone, our leaders, they always rounded on us while we were um, working on the floors and they were there to answer questions. All their they held town halls so that we can go and ask questions and it helped to keep us at ease and help to help us to stay calm, especially during this time, and it provided a lot of transparency for the team. We should prepare nurses uh, to be ready and confident for course training with rapid course training um, adaptations. We should also prepare nurses that to be able to be ready um, if they need to be reassigned to a new unit in case an event like this uh, is, is to arise in the future. We should also um, expand um, the role of, uh, of include the uh, role of family um, across uh, all settings. Um, we should reinforce the integration of family into the nursing care across all settings. We should follow up with family of someone who has died and let family know that their loved one did not die alone, that there was someone with them there. Next slide. Uh, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to my colleagues at NYU Langone for the incredible teamwork and for allowing us nurses to practice to the full extent of our education. In our patient's darkest hour, we were the light, we were the holding hand and the comforting voice. Despite their medical isolation, they were not alone. COVID-19 is a testament that proves once again, how powerful our nursing profession has been, is, and will forever be. A healing sign, an art that binds us all together as human beings who love and who care for all people. Thank you. Well, that was a wonderful way, uh, Frank, Mr. Baez, of uh, ending this panel, let me, let me start with you. you you've been there on the front lines, uh, and you've described what you've been doing. What, what's been the hardest, I have sort of a two-part question for you. What's been the hardest part for you um, in being on the front lines? What has been the very hardest thing for you? And then the second question I have is, 
uh, I understand that you've talked to many of your colleagues in order to prepare for this presentation. How are nurses feeling these days? Um, are they more inspired and empowered because of what they've been able to do? Or do you hear people saying, you know, I just really want to quit? What are you hearing from the front line? So what's been the hardest for you? And what are you hearing from your colleagues? The hardest thing for me, uh, especially um, as a new grad, has been uh, to see someone pass away with no family presence. And I think it's, it's one of the, the toughest things to see, but it, it, it somehow makes you feel good that you are there with the patient. So it's hard to see them alone and pass away, taking their last breath and uh, not being able to have anyone there. So it's been, it was really hard. And also taking care of multiple critically ill patients at the same time has, was very challenging, especially being a new grad working in an intensive care unit. For all my colleagues uh, whom I've spoken with, I've heard um, that they still, they still feel uncertain as to where we're going with uh, this pandemic, especially because there is a lot of work to be done. and. Uh, this is, this is an event that is still unfolding and is still ongoing. But there, we, we are all hopeful that things will get better and that hopefully in the coming days and the future, we'll all work together for, to better, for a better future. Thank you. We appreciate all you're doing for everyone. I have a question for Dr. Lisa Cooper. Uh, Dr. Cooper, a question. This data that you presented is very painful to see. The question starts. Are you aware of any plans to stratify the data by pre-existing condition? I would guess COVID-19 has exacerbated health disparities that we've seen in people of color for years, some of which have been a reflection of just how poorly we have done to close the gap in preventive care I hope that we can find a way to not only tighten the rope with COVID-19, but simultaneously use this pandemic as an opportunity to address disparities in other social determinants of health. Dr. Cooper. Yeah, that's a very important question. And, um, you know, I think that there are plans to look at this information stratified by, by health condition. There are ongoing analyses right now trying to look at what some of the contributors are to these racial and ethnic disparities in COVID-19 outcomes. And many of them have, in fact, shown that comorbidities play a role, but don't actually account fully for the racial and ethnic differences we see. So in some cases, it's these social factors, and then you add on the, the sort of the, the extra burden of comorbidity. And so you have um, you know, multiple sort of factors. It's almost like, uh, you know, uh, just a confluence of factors that contribute to these disparities. But as you mentioned, you know, because of other issues that come up during the pandemic that sort of make access to care uh, more difficult for people who are already struggling, um, that we are very concerned, many of us in primary care and public health and health equity work, that in fact, disparities will be further widened in the the conditions that where we already see them. So, you know, there is a lot of work looking at that, looking at whether access to uh, telemedicine services, to care management services, um, incorporating um, lay health workers, community health workers uh, to enhance access to these populations will help to close this gap. But we, we're really concerned about what's going to happen, not only as a result of the pandemic leading to increased morbidity from COVID-19, but also increased mortality and morbidity from conditions because of inadequate access and treatment. Thank you. So I have a question for Dr. Qureshi, and I'll, I'll ask uh, Lisa and Frank to chime in as well. So there is one, um, let me just see, I just had it. Uh, let's see, if a nurse provider is interested in designing a quality improvement project to tackle health disparities. What kind of practical interventions can be implemented at the healthcare setting to improve access to care? So we'll, let's, let's turn to the educator first, shall we? 
And then we'll, uh, Dr. Kuby, you're also an educator, but Chris first and then uh, uh, Lisa and Frank. Well, what I would suggest is for a provider, um, start local, meaning look at the unit or the, end, or the area within the organization that you work, where you actually have access to data to identify not only the problem, but concrete information about that problem. It makes it much easier then, and it becomes very doable. So if you have the data, I would then, um, uh, uh, that you think is important, that actually is likely to impact, um, make, um, have, make a difference, I would then convene a group. I would get a um, senior level or a person with some power to become a champion for this quality improvement project. And I would engage a multidisciplinary team to approach it. And then you come up with an intervention or a strategy based upon what the specific problem is, but you come up with something that's actually measurable and doable and take it little steps at a time. In my experience, sometimes people, they try and they try and solve every problem at one time with one intervention and that doesn't, it likely sets one up for failure. But if you start with baby steps, you can actually get, um, turn it into an avalanche of a series of um, small steps actually create a very large impact. Okay. So uh, Dr. Cooper, uh, anything to add from your perspective? If uh, the nurse wanted to design a quality improvement project to address the gap in health disparities, what would you say? So I agree with everything that's been said so far. Uh, what I would add is that going to the literature to identify evidence-based strategies would also be a good thing to do. There have been uh, several collaborative care models that involve nurses that have been shown to be effective in different settings. So taking the best of, of what's out there shown to be effective for certain conditions and either applying it to that very same population or to a similar problem uh, and adapting it to your setting and to your resources uh, would be another, you know, promising way to, to approach uh, a quality improvement project. Okay. Uh, Frank, anything to add? Yes, I, I would say to identify uh, the population, identify the community, see where they live, get a good grasp of their beliefs, what they do on a daily basis, what they, how they survive, how, what they do for work, and and just also um, form a multidisciplinary team and, and together with all the colleagues, um, identify those areas within that particular community and those places where they need, they need help, where they need to be, where you need to be working on. Right. Uh, this one is for uh, Dr. Qureshi. I'm going to uh, steer it your way, but anybody can answer too. So you made mention of the fact that nurses uh, in the, our country are used to having supplies at their beck and call. It's been hard. So what else can you tell us from other countries? What, what, what can we learn here from other countries um, in terms of addressing or fighting this pandemic? And, and I'm going to ask you, Dr. Cooper, the same. What can we learn from other countries in addressing this pandemic? Um, we can learn a lot. I personally have done a lot of work in the Pacific Islands where people, um, many people, um, and actually almost all healthcare providers on most of the Pacific Islands, they're used to not having what they need. So there's a culture of um, improvising. And many, many years ago in healthcare in the United States, there was chronic shortages of supplies all the time. It was a very weak supply chain management system across the country and public hospitals routinely ran out of things. And part of nursing school was learning how to improvise. When you don't have something, you make do with what you have and you figure out workarounds. So I think if we look to how other countries have adapted um, and have been adapting for many, many years, we can learn a lot from those individuals. Um, ask them how they have handled it. Oh, so for instance, they have been achieving high level disinfection in developing countries for years by soaking things in 
uh, one to 10 of bleach and water and then hanging, hanging the stuff out on the clothesline to dry in the sunlight for UV light. So under really, really austere conditions, people have been working with these type of situations for many, many years and um, they have the expertise in this area. So I would collaborate with them and ask them, ask them how they um, address it. The second thing I need to know, a note is this needs to be in the consciousness of um, practicing nurses and new nurses that are in nursing education that you will not always have what you need. And it creates a climate of uncertainty and fear. Um, but this is what happens during a disaster and it needs to be expected. And um, you do the best you can with the resources you have and work together to be creative. And always remember if additional resources do become available, you don't stay with your altered standard of care. You then actually then go back to um, um, providing um, um, with the resources that you have. Dr. Cooper? So it's hard to top uh, what, what Christine has already said. Um, I've had similar experiences. You know, I was born and, and raised in Liberia, West Africa. And as you all know, there's been a, an Ebola outbreak, um, a recent one in West Africa, and then another one in the DRC recently. And I heard the same kinds of stories and talked to people who did things. They had buckets outside of every room that had the mixed water and bleach solution so that people could uh, wash their hands uh, with that solution before they went into every room. They mm -hmm. made makeshift masks out of different kinds of materials and sort of doubled them and tripled them up so that they um, would be able to protect themselves to the best extent possible. They even had like these miniature ultraviolet lamps that could be used to to, um, to disinfect uh, the N95 so that they could reuse them. So I think, you know, Christine said it perfectly. You, you talk to people who have actually been in these crisis situations with lack of resources and you find out how creative they've been and how you can learn from that and do the same thing. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Cooper, you address trust when working with communities, something that Mr. Baez has talked about as well. So as a white public health nurse, and Frank, I'll, I'll turn to you after Dr. Cooper and we'll answer it from the acute care setting, but um, this questioner is, as, is asking, as a white public health nurse, what is the key strategy you might recommend to gain trust? Yeah. Well, you know, we talk about a lot of relationship-centered behaviors, you know, um, and many of them are the ones that you learn about in nursing school, you know, related to basically being very respectful of individuals and um, keeping in mind that each person you see is an individual, regardless of what you might know about that particular group on a social level, you know, you need to double check uh, those sort of that data that's from a group level on an individual level, asking people about what their beliefs, values are their own preferences, and just basically whether or not you like them or agree with them, respecting that, you know, and I use a mnemonic, I actually have that's called relate, you know, which is, is respect, uh, empathize, basically try to put yourself in the shoes of that person or family member, listen, you know, uh, spend less time talking and more time listening. Um, A is basically ask questions and ask yourself whether you're making any assumptions, talk, talk about things other than just the medical problem, but about the whole person and E engage, engage that person in decision-making anything related to their care that, um, you know, that needs to be done. So relate is my mnemonic, but of course, you know, it's, it takes practice. A lot of us think we know all these things, but I think it never hurts to remind ourselves and to also uh, observe other people who have been known to be good at what they do. Um, ask people if whether uh, you've addressed their concerns adequately or if there's any feedback they have for you. Um, and I think that that goes a long way. I think people are very forgiving actually of health professionals. Once they know that you care about them as individuals and that you are doing the very best you can on their behalf. That's, that's great. Uh, it sounds like 
things we did learn in nursing school. What do you think, <laughs> Mr. Baez, is uh, this we, what we learned in nursing school? And, and how would you talk a little bit more about uh, the trust issue? As we all know, um, the Gallup poll has listed nurses as the most trusted for a number of decades now. So how did this play out um, on the front lines, this trust issue? Um, it plays out because we as nurses, you know, we are at the bedside. We are the one at the front line. We are always with our patients. And before we talk or, or make a judgment, we listen to our patients. And we always are big advocates for our patients. Whenever they, are, they have a subjective pain, we are the ones that and they, they can swallow anything. We advocate to the nurse practitioners and the other providers to provide something um, intravenous instead of you. So um, we listen to our patients and that doesn't, you don't get that on just by practicing. You learn that in nursing school, this is your foundation. Listen to your patients, listen to the history, see um, what their beliefs are, get, uh, uh, you know, address their, 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 their concerns, concerns when it comes to diseases, but always address their concerns when it comes to spiritual and um, spirituality and, 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 no, and not being judgmental uh, from a standpoint, I think it's very important. So we've been talking about uh, trust and, and what an individual nurse might be able to do and, and, and address these needs. But um, what about the systems? Don't they have a responsibility? Um, you know, we can, as nurses, um, try to practice relationship-centered care, as you said, Dr. Cooper. But, um, you know, if the system doesn't support uh, a nurse, in a setting addressing social determinants, then um, what's to happen? So maybe, uh, Frank, it looks like you want to say something. Is there something that your employer or the health system can do to support nurses in addressing social determinants? I'll ask all of you that question. Uh, definitely. And I mean, we need systematic changes in the system that support nurses at all levels. They support nurses, in, not just in nursing school, but also in practice. And uh, they support them uh, as they become nurse researchers who want to go in the community and study this in-depth uh, um, community of researchers. Research. And we do need to make changes in our healthcare system that support nurses, that allow nurses to have a more in-depth and more trust trustful relationship with, with our patients. So, so Nate, you, you say that you, yourself, you're agreeing with me. Um, you're saying that we need more policies. Um, yeah. Can you name, name one? Name a policy that if put in place, it would, it would help you and other nurses. I, you don't want to put your system on the spot here, but you've talked to a lot of people around the country. What is a policy that a health um, employer can, um, can enable a, a nurse to do more to address social determinants? Can't think of it right, but, but I think that I mean we can yeah, we right. can def I mean I think that we can definitely uh, make a policy of, of nurses be able to feel um, safer at work and, and and not being able to feel uh, this sense like they're going to be uh, reprimanded if they speak up about an issue that they feel that there is uh, that there is you know I, I hear you okay wow wow okay uh, uh, Chris do you want to um, I, when I think about this, um, mapping this back to COVID-19, they always say during the disaster is not the time to first be meeting people. So I think in, it's incumbent upon employers to get nursing staff out there so that they engage with the community so that when a disaster occurs, um, it's not the first time they're meeting. So for instance, um, in New York State, they have community boards for ambulatory care in many counties. Usually a nurse um, sits, um, is, is typically um, one of the representatives from a local hospital. It's typically an ER nurse, so that during a disaster, the community already has a connection with someone in that entity. And that's where you develop the trust. So if I was a policymaker in a senior health system, I would be sure that I had 
all levels of nurses, everyday nurses, senior staff nurses, you don't take the person on orientation, but someone with, you know, one or two years of experience and a lot of enthusiasm um, to pepper them um, and give them exposure with ongoing community engagement, health fairs, um, screening programs, um, educational programs to the PTA, developing, having an ongoing presence in the community is how trust is built. Trust doesn't occur in a day. So as a policy, someone could develop a strategic plan and a map for that. How do we get our nurses out there? How do we position them in places so that they have ongoing contact with various segments of the community? So during times of strife, um, you can leverage those pre-existing relationships where um, trust has been cultivated and developed. Mm -hmm. Sounds like part of your model, Dr. Cooper. Yes, it certainly does. Um, you know, I did talk about in that model about, um, you know, the importance of basically really knowing your community, mm -hmm. uh, knowing the history, as well as knowing, you know, um, the societal sort of injustices that people from those communities have experienced, uh, knowing the relationship of your own organization with the community, you know, and then having those authentic partnerships with people, you know, I, it's like, there are so many organizations within the community that may do things much better than the health system would. Mm -hmm. And if we knew, like, basically where to refer people and um, what they wear, they could get certain things, like whether it's related to food or assistance with finding mm -hmm. a job and, you know, doing um, sort of job training, um, you know, whether it's something related to, you know, making sure their children's needs are met. All those things are, I think are critically important. And if the more an organization can be clear in its commitment, not only to the community, but also to the people that are in within the organization mm -hmm. that are serving that community, I think that that's like a critically important piece and transparency in, you know, how are we doing in caring for you? Uh, let's, let, we're gonna share with you how we've been doing um, and we're gonna ask you how we can do better. You know, I, I think that goes a long way. People need to know that you're not hiding something from them, you know, and to feel that you can be counted on for what you've said. So if you say, we're going to do thus and so, uh, do it, you know, or if you don't do it, come back and talk about why you, you weren't able to do it, you know, and then, you know, then being basically being competent in what you're doing, you know, so um, making sure that you are, are delivering the best quality of care that you can possibly deliver. So I think that is what we were, what I was talking about with, with structural competency. And, um, you know, we have a, a number of different organizations around the country that have, have demonstrated, you know, excellence in this. And I, I think, with what we've seen happening recently, more organizations are becoming aware of the critical importance and the role of the health system within the community as a trusted organization and partner with everyone else. It's great, yeah. There's, there's a lot of talk about um, nurses and their scope of practice. I, I'm gonna ask all of you this question, and that is um, what more could nurses do now? What, what more can they do now um, that they're maybe not doing? They're not able to do because of a limited scope of practice or because of other policy barriers. What can they do more to really address inequities in this country? What are some of the biggest things that they can do that they're not doing? You're just, you know, you wake up and you say, God darn, why is it a nurse on, that, on the job there doing this? Okay, so um, Chris, I'm gonna ask you first. Okay, um, well, I think to address something like inequities requires some type of power and authority with regards to policy. Because, I mean, as Dr. Cooper mentioned, every, every person who interfaces with um, a person for healthcare, whether you're a professional healthcare provider or you're an administrator, they need a degree of self-reflection. But to address systemic inequities, that requires policy change. 
-hmm. So it's really incumbent that nursing one views that as one of their essential roles and not just for those who have a graduate degree, but when you're a senior in nursing school, um, they take a leadership and a management course, but how much attention is paid to how do you actually serve as a leader or how is policy influenced? How do you, what are the politics of it? It's not only policy, it's politics, getting things done, getting people to do what you want them to do, power of persuasion. So I think if nursing as a profession De determines that this is one of the core essential roles of nursing, and this needs to be included in nursing education and nursing curriculum, you all, over the years, develop a cadre of people who have the confidence and view it as a responsibility that it's not only to provide good care to the client in the bed or in the community health center or wherever they're working, home care, whatever, but to become actively engaged in addressing inequities. They need to feel that they belong at that table and then they have an obligation to be there. And that stems back from how the culture of nursing and um, um, how they're educated, but then how others view them as well. So I think there's a lot of work to be done in this area. Okay, all right. So Dr. Cooper, what, what yeah. nurses, what more can they be doing here that they're yeah. not? Right. I mean, I alluded to this in my last slide, which was, you know, in these different areas that we talked about. So in clinical practice, you know, I think that, that, you know, clearly nurses know how to do counseling, but I mean, I've worked with a lot of nurses who don't use a motivational interviewing approach. So really learning how to be um, more effective in sort of counseling around behavior change, you know, um, I think that uh, being knowledgeable about how to work um, as a member of a, a real inter interdisciplinary team and really ha having clarity of roles. I think nurses can sort of lead the charge around why it's important for everyone on the team to understand what his or her unique role is. I think what results in, you know, um, our care not being delivered as efficiently and as effectively as it could be is because a lot of people just don't understand like where they fit in to the team, you know, and, and so the nurse can actually serve a critical role, I think, you know, um, as, a, as a person who really can relate very well with the physician, as well as with the patient, as well as with the other health professionals on the team, you know, the PharmDs, you know, the, the dietitians, the other sort of behavioral health people. So I think nurses play a key role in sort of being, um, you know, like a care a manager of sort of the, the overall plan. Um, that, so that's in the clinical arena, clearly in the research arena, a lot of um, uh, expertise from nurses needed and leadership and advocacy, as you mentioned, I think part of being a good leader is not only um, basically having like sort of vision and, and authority, uh, which, you know, nurses need to be given more of, but also, you know, understanding more about what other people do. So what are the other sectors doing and learning how to be an effective sort of um, convener of all these different uh, parties, learning how it all fits together so that you can more effectively advocate uh, for, you know, your particular role. So I think, you know, all of those pieces are important. And I think the sooner we begin training nurses in all these different skill sets, then, you know, by the time they are done and they get their, their licensure and all of that, they will be uh, better equipped you know, to serve in all these multiple roles, but they already are quite well prepared. And it's just that sometimes we're not tapping into their skills adequately, you know, even titration of medications, you know, why, why do you have to wait for a physician to sign everything? Certain things, if we sort of had a nice algorithm, there's no reason why a nurse couldn't go ahead and make sure the medications get adjusted for someone with straightforward high blood pressure or, you know, uncomplicated depression or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Sounds like we're talking to Florence Nightingale here. Be out in the community, know your partners, know how to convene. Okay. Frank, what would you say the, the one thing? And then I'm going to ask all of you uh, a question to wrap up and, and you'll just give me one sentence. Tell me one thing that you really want me in this audience to know. Okay. Be thinking about that. In the meantime, Frank, what more could nurses do here that they're not doing now? 
Yes, uh, it, it's not that we are not doing it. It's, it's I think you know I like I agree with with Dr. Um, Cooper, but it's also that we need to be able to pass on this knowledge to younger nurses, you know, and sort of make it easier for them to gain this information aside from, you know, we are um, communicating with everyone on all levels of the organizations and playing this very important role as part of a team. But we need to, in a positive way, teach how to be part of a team and teach this knowledge to younger nurses and support them and love them and nurture them to be like us, to be the great nurses we want to be, to be the great nurses we are. And that's how we can all uh, accomplish systematic changes by passing this knowledge to our younger ones in a, in a way where they feel supported and they feel that this is the profession I am, this is what I want to be, this is what I'm going to do, and I love this. You know, this is what we need. Well, spoken from, uh, from a voice of experience. Yeah. So yeah. You've appreciated that mentoring as a new nurse and you want to make sure that everyone gets that mentoring. I, I just, I hear Florence Nightingale. I feel Florence Nightingale as we're, or as we're speaking. So as promised, uh, we do have to wrap up here. This has been an extraordinary panel, uh, but I knew it would be. I knew it would be. So I'm going to ask each of you, what is the one thing that perhaps you didn't say that is really, really important for, for me to know for the audience to know in, in regard to nursing, nurses addressing health equity. Um, let me start with Dr. Qureshi. Um, remember our roots. Lillian Wald addressed health inequities and developed a model that we need to sometimes look back and see what worked. Florence Nightingale was a disaster nurse who also recognized health inequities during um, care for people during a war. Okay. So um, we can learn from the past to help us move forward. Learn from the past, remember our roots. Dr. Cooper. Um, I guess I'll go to my, you know, my mantra, which is sort of relationships are the foundation of healing. And so just remembering that that's critical. And so uh, bringing that relationship-centered approach to everything you do. Think about your relationship to yourself. Where are, what are your values? What are your own attitudes and, and biases? And how do, mm -hmm. how do they shape your behaviors? And then you know, think about your relationships with your patients and how can you sort of enhance the quality of those relationships with your with your colleagues and team members, and then your relationship to your community and your society. So just making sure that you are doing something within each of those realms um, to grow all the time. Okay, Mr. Baez, I'm gonna ask you to wrap it up. What is the one most important thing you'd like us to know? Uh, I think that the one most important thing uh, to know is to always remember where you come from. Remember where you start. Remember who helped you to get to where you are and always remember that you want, like I am a nurse today, I was also a new nurse, I was also a nursing student and that we should always uplift those who want to follow on our path, that we should always, always have this helping hand for others, even to ask a question and if, if, if they think that the question is invalid or inadequate, don't welcome that eye to always welcome any sort of questions and always be able to help those who want to follow on your path, such as nursing students once becoming the nurses that they want to be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to our expert panelists, Dr. Lisa Cooper, Dr. Chris Qureshi, and Mr. Frank Baez. And thank you to everyone for joining today. I think this has been an exceptional panel. I wanna personally thank you for all the work that you're doing, uh, whether it is in teaching, administration, research, on the front lines, extraordinary work, one and all. And to our, to our audience, please visit the website for more information. And we are so happy to receive any written comments always or materials at any time you know that we can only make recommendations, the committee can only make recommendations based on research and evidence. So that is what the committee is always looking for. It was great to see so much engagement today and your input is valuable to the committee as it conducts its work. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.
Thank you.